How do I get FDA approval for a medical device? How do I get funding? How do I sell a medical device? How do I, how do I, how do I? I'm Kayleen Brown, Managing Editor for Device Talks. We are on a mission to unravel the complexities of the medical device product development cycle. In each episode, we take a deep dive into a specific stage of this journey, guided by the expertise of senior medtech leaders who have not only experienced it, but have mastered it. This is MedTech Women Talks. Nicole Osborne, welcome to MedTech Women Talks. Really appreciate you spending your time with us today. We are here at Device Talks West, October 18th and 19th at the Santa Clara Convention Center. And I'm excited to dig deep into your role and branding, PR, and so much more than that. So again, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. So just to start, I mean, I know you've been deep in the industry for a number of years. Can you take us back to the beginning? I mean, what was your entry point? What made you say, yes, MedTech? Yeah, I, well, I was very fortunate that it was uh, a role at Guidant Corporation in the year 2001 that was my first foray into the medical device industry. I had started out my career in the world of tech and um, decided to pursue healthcare when that became a little bit rocky in, in 2000 um, and just fell in love with it. So I've been in med tech ever since. Um, I was with Guidant for five years the last year was actually part of Abbott after that acquisition and um, have stayed in MedTech ever since. Did you go from, did you stay with the acquisition? So from For one happened? year I did. And then I, then I um, became a consultant to Abbott after that for the, the next 10 years. So my oh. time with Abbott was pretty long at the end of the day, but it was as a consultant for the, for the last 10 years, working mostly on the MitraClip device and um, with the stent business. So how was that experience? Fantastic. It was great. I, um, so in 2007, I decided to start consulting. Um, I had young kids at home and it was time to do something new. So I actually continued on as a consultant for Abbott, working on their MitraClip device product and helping bring that to market and also other um, products such as their stent uh, division. And uh, at the same time was beginning to work with a lot of startups in the industry as well. So mostly Silicon Valley based companies and some of the cl companies that I worked with during that time went on to become very, very successful med tech companies. Many are still around today. Uh, Nevro, Shockwave, Intersect ENT, Neotract, um, and now, you know, some of those companies still remain clients today, but that was a decade of um, consulting that I was fortunate enough to work with many great med tech companies. One big hit after another, and it continues as I understand it. Yes. Wow. Yep. Well, congratulations on all your success. I, I Thank you. I have to wonder, I mean, you moved from uh, kind of a full-time employee into consultancy and freelancing. I mean, how was that transition? Uh, it was wonderful. It gave me a lot of flexibility. I think, you know, the invention of the BlackBerry and the iPhone were, were great for me because I was able to continue to be very responsive and connected to all of my clients, but have a little bit more freedom um, to be with my kids when I needed to be. Um, and then, so initially it was part-time, and then as I got busier, became definitely a full-time job until it was more than a full-time job. As I grew along with my clients. So many of those companies started out just like some of our clients today, just startups needing help with establishing their initial brand. Maybe they came to me when they had a Series A financing or were starting to think about a product, product launch. Um, and then, of course, as they become more and more successful, there's more and more opportunity, more things to do. So I eventually started the agency in 2017. Great. Well, I mean, that built beautiful context for a broader question. So take away your title and your great company and just kind of focus on your role. Can you explain kind of your role in the broader perspective of the medical device product cycle? Yeah, definitely. Um, so 
the role that I serve today is as, um, you know, running my small agency, <laughs> very focused on medical devices. But um, in a broader sense, really what we do is we help establish brands when we help launch companies and launch products in uh, in healthcare. So um, that can be everything from supporting um, clinical trial enrollment to product launches, um, you know, educating patients about new technologies through all different types of tactics um, and strategies. So um, definitely media relations is core to what we do. But even pr before um, starting you know, telling the story to the media, it's about developing a message and a brand and a presence in the market. So that's the role that we serve within uh, the medical device product uh, life cycle. So I typically ask kind of where do, does your role fit within the life cycle to try to really understand at what point other stakeholders would be communicating from with you. Uh, but from what you're saying, it sounds like you start at beginning and you're sort of at every stage of product development all the way through commercialization. Uh, can you? Yeah, we, often it is from the very beginning and we love to work with startups. That's something unique, I think, for us that we have created our business model to accommodate the needs of startups. So we uh, work with them, you know, as they need us, we're available to them and really try to become an extension of their marketing team. Um, Often our clients in the early days are the CEO or founder, and that's a lot of fun. We love helping entrepreneurs bring their innovations to market. Um, and then as they grow, we might start working with the head of marketing, and then for bigger companies, possibly the head of corporate communications or investor relations as they become more established. So we've been able to scale and grow alongside our clients, which is a lot of fun because we truly do feel that we're a part of their extended team. I mean, this industry is so familial. You'll hear me say that over and over and over again, because I believe in once you're in it, it's impossible to leave. Yes, I mean, the shared true. passion and what we get to do for a living is just such a privilege. It's fantastic. So talking kind of about reputation building and branding and media relations, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that you work with startup companies. From you know, my experience, I, I don't feel like they have in general, in, in very general, uh, realize the importance of building your brand before you really have something to start, start showing to the financial community and, you know, other stakeholders in the product development cycle. Uh, so can, how important is starting to build your brand and your reputation at that early stage? I think it's critical. I, I mean, really, it starts whether or not you know it. It starts when you create your company. Because the minute you're talking about your company, the way you talk about it, um, the way your website looks, even the area code on your contact you know, page is part of your brand. And so what we do is we help optimize and shape that and really help companies make a great first impression. It's really true. There's only one chance to make a great first impression. And so that's our job to, to really optimize that. So... Um, you know, a pitch deck, getting that early seed financing. You have a brand when you're out there talking to investors, and I don't think it's ever too early to start thinking about it. It's definitely changed the way that I think about approaching uh, kind of the business model from ideation to commercialization, and it makes so much sense to me now that I've taken kind of a step back. As I said, I mean, you only have a first one chance, first chance to make a first impression. Uh, so that kind of being said, I assume that you collaborate with other, I keep saying roles or stakeholders, the medical device product cycle. So what are those roles and like, at what point do you collaborate with them? So um, we collaborate either directly or indirectly with almost every function within an organization. So we collaborate with definitely marketing, um, the executives, I think um, helping to translate the vision of the founder or the CEO of the company. Um, certainly the clinical team, it's really important for us to understand what the milestones are that are coming up. Um, and that really comes down to the communication 
but you know, even internally. So we can help our clients, if it's a marketing contact, for example, to understand what's coming up over the course of the next six to 12 months and create a strategic plan. Um, we have found sometimes, you know, a peer review publication pops up online that the marketing person never knew about. The clinical person knew. They were working with a physician that decided to publish something. <laughs> Um, but they never told the right person within marketing. And so that's a missed opportunity for us. If we, if we had just known to ask the question, what publications are on the horizon, we can create a communications plan to make sure that those are optimized as opportunities to tell the company's story. Because um, the news cycle is very short. And when you're communicating news, it needs to be timely. It can't be something that happened a month ago. So we do need to know in advance um, to the best of our ability, what is on the horizon and be able to act quickly. And we have successfully gotten, you know, great media coverage for our clients with a online publication that we were able to quickly, you know, put together an announcement and reach out to media. We can do that, but it's, it's always going to be better if you can plan for it. So that's just one example, but certainly regulatory, legal, <laughs> investor relations, um, all kind of come together in communications. Well, to your story and your your um, case point, if you will. So then, um, do you have any tips for working with the media? Yes, um, I think in the early stage. Well, first, I would say step one: creating that foundational messaging. And we love to do this. There's there's always an existing message, probably. A, early website, an investor pitch deck, um, other materials that have been developed, usually with a single audience in mind. So maybe they're, you know, um, focusing on clinicians or investors. What we do is come in and try to really understand the story from a broader audience perspective. How does it fit into the context of the current standard of care, um, positioning it against the standard of care or against your competitors and really making it impactful and short. Attention spans are short. So we want to um, really gain that interest from key audiences and get them to want to ask more. So we create a very strong foundational messaging platform and that's really step one. I think that's important to do from the very early days so that you can be prepared and you can also um, prepare third parties who might be talking about you. Maybe there's a physician presenting at a conference or doing an interview for local media, you know, at a clinical trial site, providing, you know, information for them to share that is how you want your story to be told with the supporting evidence, very factual, uh, not marketing language, but very fact-based and um, that will really resonate with the audiences is so important. And as objective, you know, third parties, we can we can really help with that. Um, and it's worth just doing an audit too of what is your social media presence, what is your digital presence. People are going to be doing research. You know, what happens if someone puts your um, new technology in YouTube? What will that person see, whether it's a clinician or a patient? Because they will do it. And so we try to optimize that environment to make it, um, you know, to, to really maximize every opportunity to build the brand and tell your company's story. So you talked about video messaging on YouTube, websites, uh, or a website, uh, presentations at maybe industry conferences. What about press releases? So I am the managing editor for Device Talks, and I get hundreds of press release emails a day, and I find them to be very relevant. Uh, so do you have any tips for, well, one, do you think that they're still relevant from your perspective? And two, uh, do you have any tips for writing them and using them? Yes. Press releases are relevant. They are an enduring tool for communications to the media. Um, and I do have tips for them. Um, First of all, anything important, I would put in the first half of the press release. I don't 
Maybe you're reading the entire press release, but, but I think span, I think you're on to something. <laughs> yeah. You don't want people to miss like a really impactful quote because it's at the bottom of the second page. So concise and um, impactful, definitely in the first half of the press release. The headline is really important. Some people will only read the headline. You really need to try to grab their attention. And um, we really write for the end audience of the media. So um, especially if, we're try if it's something that has consumer or patient interest. So not using jargon, not using inside baseball. Um, we use press releases as a tool. So, uh, you know, we try to reach media with news before the release crosses the wire, ideally, so that they're prepared for it. We are basically our job as communicators is to make the media's job very, very easy. <laughs> we want to make it so that they just think, oh, I have to cover this. This is so easy. They've given me everything. I understand it. Everything I need is here. Spokespeople are ready. The, you know, we can easily schedule an interview. Um, so yeah, press releases are a tool and they are important. And I think rating for clarity and impact is very important too. So I have a sister question to press releases. Again, I get so many press releases press press releases sent to me and typically if it's a very general press release my attention span shrinks even smaller but I find when it's really targeted to what I cover and um, maybe is relevant to my, again what I what I cover the topics I cover or what I'm about to cover then I will make the time in the space to really look into it and look at the mm -hmm. the research and the additional documents with it be it a white paper or a presentation so how important is it to target the outreach kind of as a companion to the press releases to the specific media outlets that you're targeting? That's really important. I mean, I, I think that's critical to, um, we do a lot of targeted media outreach, especially with the mainstream media, um, national media, business media. It's really to successfully obtain national media coverage from the top tier media. So Forbes, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today. Um, it has to be very, very targeted. And I think it's important to, um, to communicate to the reporter that you understand what they cover. You know, you're, you're specifically sending this to them, not just that, you know, here is one of hundreds of, you know, people that you are not special <laughs> for the top tier. It's extremely important. I think for trade media, understanding generally what they cover and getting it to them in a timely manner and making it as easy to understand as possible is, is really critical. Um, we have a former Wall Street Journal reporter on our staff that we've worked with closely for years. And he has told us that as a Wall Street Journal reporter, if there was any excuse or reason not to cover a story, he wouldn't cover it. If it was too complicated or technical, if the you know if it was too difficult to schedule an interview, because there were so many things. I mean, he could cover anything, so he wasn't going to work very hard <laughs> to like really pursue something if we weren't making it easy for him. So we take that to heart, and we really try to get the media what they need and also in a really timely manner. So for example, right now we're working on preparing for an FDA approval for one of our clients. And this is something not all companies understand. It really takes time to get those big, deep stories. And we need patients, we need clinicians, we need to have all of our ducks in a row to be successful with that. And we can be and have been. Um, you know, we have worked with every media outlet and we know how to work with them. But it takes time to, you know, have the right patients lined up, have those KOLs prepped, have that messaging really solid, have it reviewed by legal and regulatory, understand, the, you know, anticipate the questions that you'll get because we as I mentioned, really invest a lot into developing a messaging platform. But there's also a Q&A, which is the kind of other side, which is 
you know, the things you don't necessarily want to talk about, either because they're not a priority or just because you hope they don't come up, they will come up. <laughs> so you have to think through <laughs> all of the tough questions and uh, anticipate those and be ready to respond to them. And that's an area where, for example, we work very closely with investor relations. We need to know what analysts are hearing from the IR team and what the, what the street is saying, for, especially for a company that's public um, or for a company competing with a company that's public. So if you're launching a product that competes with Medtronic or Abbott or J&J and it potentially could take market share, those audiences are going to be interested in what you're doing, even if you're a small company, if the market is big enough. So, so again, it's just kind of about that positioning and really understanding who to get it in front of and when. Yes. Makes a lot of sense. So reading, reading. Re a lot of reading <laughs> lot and of following a lot of people yeah. on Twitter. <laughs> yes. Constant, there's, X con X. <laughs> yeah. there's constant changes, so... Yeah. Do you use LinkedIn or is Twitter LinkedIn, X your X? Well, X is more for me, at least personally, listening, kind of seeing what people are talking about. Uh, there, almost every reporter is on it, so it's a great way to get a little bit of insight into them, what they care about, what they're talking about. Um, LinkedIn is far and away the best way to um, reach you know, the audiences that um, medtech companies usually are interested in reaching. Investors, of course, um, clinicians tend to be on LinkedIn. I follow a lot of reporters on LinkedIn because especially with the changes at X, more and more are moving to, to LinkedIn. So, um, you know, that's really helpful to be able to keep track of what they're working on and what they're writing about. What's a lot to balance at one time. Yes. So you talked a lot about a traditional media. Are there other ways that medtech companies can tell their stories? I think you have to tell your stories in other ways, too, because traditional media will only take you so far. Um, the media landscape has changed so much. So really, you know, any company, any person can be a publisher today. And so we... we um, think a lot about content marketing, developing content, sharing content, thought leadership, social and digital marketing. There's a lot of opportunity to tell your story through video, um, bylined articles, and then there are things like speaking opportunities, awards. Um, you know, we when we develop a plan, we look at that, all the milestones that are coming up for the company, sort of news events, but also filling it in with what are the other ways we can reach those audiences with the messaging that we're developing? So we have to get a little bit creative. It's a lot. It is a lot. So I've heard video, audio, print, in-person, award recognition. Podcast, Podcast, device talks. We love pitching Tom and device <laughs> talks, of course. Well, we love he does such you. a good job. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, so you're kind of talking about how uh, we are... Uh, like the landscape is evolving. The media landscape is forever evolving. So that leads me to the big elephant in the room, AI machine learning. I think if we had this conversation a year ago, I probably would have asked this question. But now I have to. So has AI, especially generative AI, uh, which has you know, really democratized AI for the me's of the world. You know, how has that changed your role and your responsibilities today yeah. and how do you think it's going to change in the future and you define what you mean by future because future ai can be a month from now or it could be five years from now this is a matter of hot debate <laughs> amongst marketers and advertisers and something we're really interested in so we actually just had internally a, a um, generative ai training um, for our team which was really excellent, and it just was scratching the surface. There, I don't think anyone knows exactly how it will impact um, what we do today. I will say that it's something we're very interested in. It definitely can spark, you know, some creative ideas, and um, we have a, a sort of a policy that the PR council has developed that we've adopted internally around it, using it ethically. I mean, there are some pitfalls. So I think it's really early days. I don't think we know yet exactly how it will 
impact um, our industry, but it is something that is really exciting. And I think hopefully will be a force for good and make us more efficient, uh, which is a, which is, you know, a good thing. Um, but no, ask me in a year. I think it's going to, you know, really start unfolding quickly. So I will, I promise a year from today, we will follow up on this conversation and see how your role has changed and what new tools are out there and how that's really um, optimized, you know, how you do your job and help support all of the other medical device companies that you support. Uh, So uh, we talked a lot about branding, reputation building, uh, connecting with traditional and alternative media. Are there any resources that our audience can go explore to learn more, to be connected to the right space? I think, you know, really going to the heart of what we do in terms of developing a message, I think that's a really important part of what we do. And I do have a a resource to recommend there, which is a book called Smart Brevity, um, which was written by the founders of Axios, which is a media outlet. Um, And I have really, I think we've always been of the mindset to sort of adopt the, the type of rating that they recommend to really reach audiences that are reading on an iPhone, which is the way a lot of people are consuming information today. So I think that is a a book that I would recommend to people. And then also if you're, you know, really um, pay attention to what is out there, how people are using social media, what is getting your attention, uh, what reporters are covering in the news. Um, But you you do need to bring in probably an expert at the right time um, to successfully build your brand and tell your story. I don't think that you necessarily have to hire someone full time or even work with an agency long term or it could even just be a freelancer. But I mean, if I I'm a writer, that's what I do. But if we're developing a website, I hire a copywriter who knows how to write for websites like it really is worth it (laughs) to hire experts to make sure you're putting your best foot forward so I would say you do and that's an investment and I understand that but I think it is worth investing even you know some companies have really unfortunate names it's just unfortunate that they didn't hire someone to help them create a great name because it's hard to change your name later in some cases they're public companies and they oh gosh, this name doesn't even reflect what we do anymore. So we've helped rename companies or, you know, name products. Um, That's important. So just being willing to bring in the best people, just as you, you know, to, to be successful in anything that you do, you bring in the best people you possibly can find to help you. Um, That's what I would recommend at the end of the day. That's a perfect way to wrap up today's conversation. Nicole Osborne, thank founder you. and CEO of Health and Commerce, thank you for being with me today on MedTech Women Talks. I really appreciate your time and your perspective, and I'll see you a year from today. <laughs> Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. It's fun. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of MedTech Women Talks. Please share this episode on social media, to your coworkers, to that new hire who's overwhelmed by the nuances of med tech, and to that seasoned executive who is looking for a way to educate and inspire. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the Device Talks Podcast Network to never miss an episode. Our next will feature Christina Hawley, Senior Director of Clinical Operations at May Health. The perspective of the clinical gatekeeper. But before I let you go, I'd like to shout a big thank you from our figurative rooftop to our sponsors, Aptix, Catalyze Healthcare, Confluent Medical, and Cretix. It is only with their support that we've been able to create this incredible series. Want to join the best sponsors in MedTech? There's still time. Connect with me on LinkedIn or reach out to our Device Talks Editorial Director, Tom Salemi. Once again, I'm Kayleen Brown of Device Talks, and we'll be back soon with Christina Hawley, Mayhem. Mayhem.